All right. Um, I'm going to welcome Jesse Myers here from OnRamp. He's going to talk about the having. Great, yeah. All right. Hello, everyone. Yeah, uh, I'm Jesse Myers. I'm from OnRamp Bitcoin. We are the uh, uh, leading provider of multi institution, multi customer, multi institution, multi sig custody for Bitcoin specifically. But right now, I'm here to talk about the having. So, inspired by Willie earlier, who here, show of hands, who here celebrated last night the having? Okay, so that's like two thirds, which means a third of you, that was a weird sentence. Uh, and this is really for you guys then. So, what is the having? All right, so yesterday we had the having. This is the screenshot I took on, on my flight here of uh, mempool.space celebrating the having. That's that yellow block. That's block 840,000. And that's a big event. That's very special for Bitcoin. It's our fourth halving in, in 15 years. And it's the beginning of the next era for Bitcoin. Um, the next four years will be the, the fifth epoch for Bitcoin. So where are we as we begin the fifth epoch for Bitcoin? Well, we are here. We are a trillion dollar asset class, more or less. Uh, in a $900 trillion uh, global asset ocean. Um, and how did we get here? And where will we go from here? It's, uh, for me, it's all about the having. So this is Bitcoin's entire monetary policy, this expression on the left. We're at, we're at MIT, so we're going to go into some of the, the math and the details a little bit in this talk. This is everything for Bitcoin. This is the supply expression for how Bitcoin releases its supply going from zero, day one, until eventually 21 million. How do you go from zero to 21 million? You release it block by block. So that 50, in, in the first epoch for Bitcoin, 50 Bitcoin were released per block. And that gets divided by this two, which has that important I exponent there. Every time we go through 210,000 blocks, that I increments upwards. And then you're dividing that 50 by you know, another uh, exponent of two. So the result of that is this table on, on the right of the block, or block subsidy specifically. So uh, the miners receive um, the block subsidy plus the fees included in any, in any block. The block subsidy is how Bitcoin supply is issued over time. And we just went yesterday from 6.25 Bitcoin per block released to 3.125. Here's that in code, since we are at MIT, and um, it's pre-programmed into the Bitcoin protocol, and it's unstoppable. So you know, every, every four years we have this work, this this uh, narrative of like, will the, will the having not happen or for some reason, or you know, people who aren't into Bitcoin wonder that. But it, here it is, it's just code and everybody's agreed to this code by participating in the Bitcoin protocol. Um, it, you know, the key there is that uh, having equals n height block height divided by the 210,000. And once it reaches the next integer, it, it increments up and changes the uh, the uh, subsidy for for the for blocks for the next two hundred and ten thousand blocks. So uh, this is where we are at <clears throat> in terms of Bitcoin's overall supply issuance over time. This is a chart I got from Pierre Richard and added to it. Um, you can see this asymptotic line going up and to the right. That's our our supply currently in circulation, and it approaches that. 21 million flat line. Um, so you, in that sense, you can see how you know, the supply issuance is slowing down. We are, we are experiencing increasing scarcity of new, new supply. And that's what the, the orange bars show. <clears throat> so in the first era, 50, block, 50 Bitcoin of subsidy per block, then 25, 12 and a half, 6.25, you can see that exponential decline. And it is approaching zero and will effectively be zero in 
you know, depending on how you look at it in 12 years. Um, <clears throat> so that, that's, that is Bitcoin's supply issuance schedule. It is increasing scarcity of new supply issuance, terminating in absolute scarcity. And that's huge because that's never been possible before in the physical world with any asset. You can't have absolute scarcity in the physical realm. You can only have that in the digital realm. And Bitcoin is the invention of digital scarcity and the simultaneous invention of absolute scarcity. And that's a, a huge deal for, for assets. This halving is, is also exciting because today, yesterday, we just got better than gold in terms of our supply issuance per year. Uh, and that makes, you know, the, you can see that, that drop right there below the blue line that is gold. And that means that Bitcoin now is a better store of value asset than gold. Uh, and if you remember the, the um, chart earlier, gold is a 12 to $16 trillion asset. Bitcoin right now is a $1 trillion asset. So that's a 10, 10 plus X to match gold. And in my opinion, the only reason we, we haven't done that yet, and maybe we don't do that over the next four years, is because people are still catching up to what Bitcoin means and, and, and why it's an attractive asset to hold. Okay, so taking it back a little bit here, um, Bitcoin's entire price appreciation story to me is about supply and demand. And so here's your, your classic supply and demand, your Marshall Cross, this Econ 101 stuff. Um, and price is set where supply and demand meet. But Bitcoin is different because Bitcoin has completely inelastic supply. Its new supply issuance doesn't care how much supply the market wants. It's going to produce what it's pre-programmed to produce in any given four year period. And then it drops. The, so the supply created shifts every four years. Um, and obviously that the intersection with the demand curve changes and changes again, and will keep changing. This, uh, you know, of course, is a bit of a static view, and it doesn't take into account all the um, external variables of how demand might shift, probably lateral shift, um, as more and more people learn about Bitcoin and realize they want to include it in their portfolio, and it becomes de-risked from a, from a geopolitical point of view as well. Um, but the point here is that you can see that in a vacuum, that where supply meets demand on the, on the y-axis um, goes up as the amount of Bitcoin being produced decreases. Uh, so to take a, a, a different lens of the same idea here, this is where we've been for whether or not you knew it for the last 30 days. Um, based on the current market price of Bitcoin, all else equal here. So this does assume that supply and demand are, have been in balance for the last month, but that happens when the price goes sideways, all else equal. So for the price of Bitcoin to go sideways, there needs to be enough net inflowing demand to absorb the newly created Bitcoin over the course of that month from mining. And at current prices, the amount of Bitcoin being mined for the last 30 days was $1.8 billion worth of Bitcoin. Price has gone sideways. That meant that there was, uh, had to have been $1.8 billion of net inflowing demand. All else equal, there's a ton of noise here, but this is, these are the core mechanics. That's the last 30 days. The halving happened last night. What does it look like going forward? What's the next 30 days? Because of the halving, there will only be $900 million of Bitcoin produced from mining over the next 30 days. But that doesn't mean that demand will drop by half. Ostensibly, it'll remain the same. And then you have a problem. You have a shortage. You have a supply shortage, and that can accumulate into a supply shock. So bear with me here. We're going to get into kind of the, the mechanics as I see them of why the Bitcoin halving drives a major bull market over the ensuing 12 to 18 months. Okay, so this is right before the halving. We have that supply and demand balanced. 
uh, the amount of, of new supply, the orange block there, is equal to the amount of inflowing demand you have, you've established price equilibrium between supply and demand. Um, at any given time, there's, there's a certain amount of Bitcoin that's available for sale. 5% uh, of Bitcoin has moved in the last month, typically, so that's, what, that's the size of that box. Relative to the whole circle is the total circulating supply of Bitcoin. Not all of that is available for sale. So what really sets the price is what's available for sale. And we'll see how the mechanics here play out. So this is before the halving, then the halving occurs. Not as much supply is being created, but just as much demand is coming in, and that starts to chip away at available for supply. Three months later, you've eaten a little bit of what was available. And then that continues. The price has to, as the amount of available for sale supply starts to shrink, uh, the market has to find more supply. The only way to do that is for the price to drift upwards in order to induce holders to become willing sellers. So the price starts to drift up at this point. And then it keeps drifting up. And as it keeps drifting up, more demand comes in because people get excited. Why is the price of Bitcoin why does it keep going up for the last six months? I want in on that. It's going to keep going up. I want, I want to buy more. So now you're suddenly eating bigger chunks. Granted, you're also starting to inspire some long-term hodlers to start selling some supply. But this starts to accelerate. The imbalance starts to accelerate. And now you've really reached mania conditions where you're chewing through available for, for sale supply because of the, the imbalance of demand versus supply from mining and supply from uh, hodlers becoming willing to sell. And what we're talking about here is, is, is a development of, a, of mania. This, this is what mania looks like. And that's a bubble. And that's the reality of what a Bitcoin halving creates. It creates the conditions for a bubble over the next 12 to 18 months because of that accumulation of the supply shortage, a supply shock. And that's been the story of Bitcoin. If you really want to take out the noise and look on a log chart uh, at the Bitcoin price over time, it looks you know, more or less like this. Um, and that shouldn't surprise us because we have these vertical points in time where supply, demand, price equilibrium is upended. And then the Bitcoin price, the market, has to go through a process of reestablishing equilibrium. The price has to drift up. People get too excited. They overextend themselves. It turns into mania, turns into a bubble, goes higher than it should have gone. And then the reverse action happens where there's a crash on the backside. But it ends up finding some equilibrium just in time for the next halving to arrive to upend that supply, demand, price equilibrium again, and the process repeats. The key about these bubbles is that the conditions of the bubble, the condition that created the bubble is not undone by the bubble running its course. So there's less Bitcoin being mined you know, after the halving, and that is permanent. So you don't go back to the conditions that, that were before. And that's the major difference between Bitcoin's bubbles that are permanent and cumulative versus something like a tulip mania where you know, you, there's, there's, no, there's nothing stopping you from going back to prior conditions. So this is what we've been living through. And those mechanics are still there for the halvings to, the halvings will keep happening every four years, every 210,000 blocks. And price will continue to react to it in, in this very organic, inevitable sort of pattern. What this amounts to, as you can see on, on the y-axis here, is that the purchasing power of one Bitcoin goes up over time. That's the, the inevitable outcome of Bitcoin's increasing scarcity, is that Bitcoin that you hold grows in purchasing power over time. That makes Bitcoin a savings technology. You put value in it today, and it will grow over time. That's a, that's a crazy thought. 
Uh, but that's the reality of the mechanics of, of Bitcoin's increasing scarcity. So with that in mind, remember this is where we're at today. Just one trillion of a $900 trillion global asset landscape. And if what I said is true, and if that made sense to you, Bitcoin is a savings technology that grows in value over time. Then the question becomes, how much of the world's value might be interested, as they learn about this, in storing their value that's currently in bonds or real estate or any of these other buckets, instead in Bitcoin? So that's why the halving is a huge deal. And yesterday was uh, the most important day in Bitcoin's calendar. My favorite day of my, the only holiday at this point that I celebrate. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I hope that you guys appreciate that that's, that's what just happened yesterday. And, it was, and today it feels like total non-event. Nothing feels different today. But as the mechanics play out over the next 12 months and you're starting to wonder what's going on, why is there another bull market happening for Bitcoin, it's because of yesterday. So that, that's all I had on the having. If, if there are any questions, that, actually, I think I have a little more time. I'm not sure. Um, no, is that, is that all? Okay. We have enough time for like two questions, a couple of questions. So. One and two, your hand was up first. So if you guys want to come here, you can lead in that. Uh, best slides I've ever seen. Hopefully you make them available. Um, one remark about gold. If you've ever tried to do a gold deal, there's a 3% commission on both sides. It takes 12 months if you're lucky to negotiate. Um, and it, the buyers don't have money and the gold people really don't have the gold. Whereas I think Bitcoin's a little cheaper than a 3% commission. Yeah. And so that's another efficiency. Yes, uh, absolutely. It, what, what he's pointing out is that uh, when comparing Bitcoin to gold, there are all these other hidden frictions involved in, in using gold as a store of value asset. Commissions on both sides of the trade are bigger than with Bitcoin. It's a more illiquid market. <laughs> and you don't even know the, total, the above ground supply of gold. I mean, I, I mentioned 12 to 16 trillion because of varying estimates about how much gold there actually is. Uh, and, you know, other reasons why gold is not as good of a store of value asset, and in our opinion, it sounds like, versus Bitcoin. Hey, um, in the slide that showed the issuance rate of Bitcoin versus gold, going forward, it's very flat. I forget if it was 0.4% or, or something, it's just flat, it goes down, it's flat. But historically, it was very fuzzy, the Bitcoin lines. What accounts for that fuzziness of the lines? Great up, question. Up until the present. Yeah, so um, the, the noise in it is, is because of, um, hash rate varying versus expected uh, and and miners coming on and offline and um, that in, in, interacting with the difficulty adjustment. Um, the fact that the, the very first one there kind of sloped down, I guess we'll just jump back to what that was. So the, in, this, in the start of the graph when it's quickly coming down, that's because um, very early on the amount being mined each month was very significant relative to the existing circulating supply. Uh, and so as you're adding to that total, it becomes less and less significant rather quickly. So it's just that there wasn't much of a base in the beginning to, for those calculations. Yeah, awesome. All right, thank you, thank you all.